Okay, I think we're going to get started. So I want to thank everybody for coming and attending this evening at this late hour. I'm hoping that your Sunday was great and wonderful and now have some time to take care of yourself. Um, my name is Estriona Friedman. I am Shalva's Orthodox Outreach Coordinator. You'll hear a little later about some of the services that we do. One of them is outreach and education. Programmings like tonight is one of our ways of doing outreach and education and, and helping to educate the community. Um, we are lucky to have Dr. Alyssa Hellman with us tonight as well, who will be presenting. Um, I want to also thank Carol Ruderman, who helped to, our executive director, who helped put this together, as well as my friend Rachel Fight, who's helping me on the back end, and Vicki Rifkin, who is not here today, um, but really, really stepped in and took care of a lot of the technical stuff as well. I'm going to tell you all a little bit about Shalva and who we are as an agency, and then we'll get to um, Dr. Hellman. As soon as I can figure this out. So I want to share with you who we are and what our mission is at Shalva. Shalva supports Jewish women experiencing and healing from domestic abuse through counseling, supportive services, and community education, like programs like tonight. Um, Shava services anybody who self-identifies as Jewish, so we service the entire gamut of the Jewish population. We have culturally sensitive workshops, and our counselors are totally understanding and sensitive of the needs of the from community. Um, a little bit about who we are and how we got started. Shava is the oldest independent Jewish domestic abuse agency in the US. We provide counseling, supportive services, and community education since 1986. Um, we've worked to break the cycle of abuse through education and community, and I'm sorry, and counseling. Um, some of the history is that um, it was actually started 33 years ago, about by Robinson Weinberg from Baltimore came to Chicago and she brought a group of women together around the table and said, we're experiencing this in Baltimore. It must be happening in Chicago as well. And these women got together and they formed Shalva and it has grown and it has blossomed into this big ginormous agency that services all the Jewish community. And we are here for everybody to help everybody. Some of what we do, we have, well, some of what we do, let's start with our legal services. We have an in-house um, family law attorney who can help work with our clients. She can help guide them, direct them, interpret papers, and can do some limited representation, as well as our legal counsel tries to solicit other lawyers and um to work with our clients at a sliding scale or a pro bono. Um, we have our counseling services. Our counseling services is really the meat and potatoes of who we are. And it's through that counseling that the women come in and can um, talk with a master's level counselor and work with them for as long as she needs. Sometimes we have women that come in and they come in for a little while and then stop coming and then they'll come back. And then, you know, they're there to meet them where they're at and help support them. Um, they don't, they don't, the counselors don't tell the clients what to do. They help support them in what they think they should do. They know what's best for them. So if a woman chooses to stay in her marriage, they support her through that, through education, through counseling and giving her tools how to best navigate that. As well as if she chooses to leave the marriage, as well, they will do the same thing and support her as well. Um, as well, we have an intake person that when you call, will answer the phone. You're not getting an answering machine um, during normal business hours and they'll do a formal intake. One of the things that I'd like to suggest is if somebody isn't sure what's going on in their relationship, give a call and speak to somebody there. There's no charge. None of our services cost anything. Um, 
and they can help better tease out what's going on in your relationship, as well as if you have a family member, a loved one, a friend, so a coworker, someone you're concerned about, you can also call up and get some guidance into how to navigate that and manage that. And then we have our educational services where we go out into the community and we provide education and resources and workshops and webinars and different programming that we provide. Um, one of the things that we have at Shava, which is unique, is our Orthodox Rabbinic Task Force. This is a group of Rabbanim, rabbis, that have been given extensive training, understanding of how to work with a client that may be struggling in an abusive relationship or marriage. Um, and they work in tandem, and they can work in tandem with our therapist so that as orthodox Jews we have the rabbinic guidance we have the um, psychological guidance and that really is a whole holistic approach as well as we do provide some financial support and assistance and um, all of our work is extremely extremely done in the highest strictest confidentiality we are very careful if somebody calls or wants to come in now most of it is done over zoom or on the phone, but when women were coming into the office, which is in an undisclosed location, they were able, they, we would, um, somebody would come in and if people were around, people went away so that the client can maintain confidentiality. Um, and like I said, if you or somebody you know is struggling or you're just not sure, please feel free to call. 773-583-4673 or email or connect somehow with Shalva. We are here to help you. We're here to help the community. So thank you. Um, at this time, there we go. At this time, I'd like to take the opportunity to um, introduce Dr. Alyssa Hellman. An experienced board certified OBGYN, Dr. Hellman, has been in clinical practice for over 11 years in Milwaukee. She is also the physician at the Confident Kala, a telemedicine gynecological practice focused on the needs of Jewish women who observe Taras HaMishpacha. Throughout her years as a clinician, she's noticed a gap in women's health awareness and education. She developed into a special interest in patient education and being a resource for the Jewish community in relation to body awareness and women's perspective health, starting from a young age. She's also a great influencer and a great blogger and just a wonderful person. And we are so privileged to have her here because we're so lucky that she understands, again, the dynamics of what a firm woman may need and that medical piece as well. And the idea of making sure that we do take care of ourselves regardless of our relationship. So I'm honored and privileged, Dr. Hellman, the floor is yours. I just wanna say before I give you that floor that afterwards we will have um, open Q&A and you can either put it in the chat or in the Q&A and everything is anonymous. So nobody will know who's sending those questions. Dr. Hellman. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. I agree with all that stuff, except for the influencer label. I don't know if I'm there yet, but maybe one day. Um, all right, let me um, share my screen with you and we'll get started. All right. Does that look good? Everyone can see it. Um, all right, so um, I'm here today to um, kind of talk for Shalva about prioritizing your health, why you matter, and self-care as a Jewish woman. Um, so let's um, jump right in. All right, just a few reminders um, that some of the stuff Esther Yona did go over. Um, all the questions that will, um, we have an opportunity to go over Q&A and for you to put your own questions in about really anything related to women's health. They are all anonymous. Um, put them in the Q&A box. Also, though I am a Orthodox from woman and an OBGYN, I am not a halachic authority. So I would always strongly encourage you if there's ever a halachic component to any of your questions that you would ask um, your local Orthodox rabbi. Um, and um, I think I mentioned already that just en enter your questions in the Q&A box and we'll go over them at the end. All right. 
So just a little bit more about me and kind of why I kind of came to this um, point um, in my life is, um, so I am an OBGYN. I've been practicing for about 11 years in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, I, once COVID started, I just kind of realized that, you know, the world is going virtual. Um, I started a telemedicine practice called the Confident Kala. Um, and it's really geared towards women who may have questions related to their women's health that they really haven't had the opportunity to ask their own doctors or felt comfortable because they felt kind of awkward or weird about going over the, or what their specific concerns were um, related to practicing the Haras Hamishbacha. Um, but why did I name it the Confident Kala? Because I really felt like every woman should feel confident in their choices related to women's health, whether that's contraception, their pregnancies, um, before marriage, um, getting to the point when you're done having kids and dealing with potential bleeding issues. So any point in a woman's life that they should feel confident about their choices. Um, and Kala, because a lot of these issues kind of start once a woman enters into the phase of being engaged or being married, um, and it kind of extends throughout that entire part of her life. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. And as I kind of was starting this practice, I realized that a big, big part of it is not just seeing the individual woman in an appointment, but also about education and just making people aware of things that they may not have had the exposure to in their education um, and how much that education really empowers women to make the right choices for themselves. All right, so this is our lineup for this evening. Um, and it's kind of like a lot of stuff that, um, whoops, that goes together um, that will all connect at the end. So A, what does it mean to prioritize your health, regular health maintenance, being in tune with warning signs um, in your body, asking questions and advice from a, your rabbi and doctor, advocating for yourself um, in many different parts of your life um, and educating um, yourself and your family. And I think it's very fitting that we kind of talking about this for Shalva because, you know, for an organization that helps women through domestic abuse, um, it's really part of kind of starting the process of healing from that and getting out of that is learning how to advocate for yourself, how to recognize warning signs. And that really extends to so many other parts of your life, whether you're dealing with a domestic abuse issue or not. All right, so what is self-care? Self-care is literally taking care of yourself and addressing your needs. Um, it's not just getting a facial, going to the spa, getting a mani-pedi, right? Um, it's really like an attitude and different perspective that extends to all different areas of your life. It's about prioritizing yourself, paying attention to your body, your needs, your singles, your signals. We really, I mean, right, as, as kind of busy moms, wives, in the workplace, whether you're at home and managing so much, there's so many other people in our lives who need us, who we do things for, running errands, and ourselves and kind of get lost in the shuffle a little bit. And we kind of, you know, our priorities always end up being our children, our husbands, our work, or other people who depend on us, but that kind of makes us sometimes procrastinate on ourselves because there's always someone else who we think is more important. Right, so what does this mean like in the medical world or the medical realm here? So, you know, when we wanna think about, well, how do we start taking ourselves, uh, taking care of ourselves? One of the most important things is routine health maintenance. And I think we, when we ignore ourselves and we procrastinate kind of, um, you know, working on identifying our own concerns and our own issues is that we forget about the, the health maintenance that helps prevent or identifies early a medical condition or concern that maybe doesn't, wouldn't get so bad if we had done a routine health maintenance. And what does that really entail? One is like a yearly doctor's visit, whether it's your regular doctor, whether it's your OBGYN, um, it could be just one or the other, um, depending on what kind of needs you have. And um, what happens at a lot of those visits are going over and making sure that you're up to date with your screening tests. So what are screening tests? They're usually tests done to say, hey, like, does it seem if 
there's going to be a risk for cancer, or, you know, we just want to make sure that something silent isn't going on in your body that we can detect early to help prevent it or to treat earlier. And those tests involve things like pap smears, which is cervical cancer screening, mammograms, which is breast cancer screening, and colonoscopies, which are colon cancer screening. Also, don't forget about going to the dentist, right? Every six months is kind of what's standard. Um, we often forget about that. We're good about making appointments for our kids, but not so much for ourselves. Um, and then other things too, like physical therapy, if you are having pain somewhere, um, and you know, sometimes it's hard to go to appointments where it's once a week or twice a week, um, but can vastly improve the quality of your life, the function of your life, and actually help you take care of your family and yourself better. And then of course, of course, mental health. Um, it's, I think this is probably one of the easiest things to really put on the back burner uh, because we just keep plugging away at our daily life responsibilities and we kind of forget or push away the fact that we just aren't feeling ourselves or we're not feeling right or we're not really feeling happy. So mental health appointments and seeing a mental health professional is really one of the best things you can do for yourself if you feel like you aren't doing well in that regard. All right, but what if you know like, hey, there is something wrong, right? I don't just need to work on my health maintenance, but I also have to work on being in tune with any warning signs that my body is showing me. So from an OBGYN perspective, are you having a regular bleeding? Are your periods a little bit different than they used to be? Um, chronic pain, pelvis, back, shoulders, knees, hips. Um, are you getting headaches a lot more than you used to? Is your vision starting to change? So those are just some um, warning signs that could be something super serious, could be not serious at all, but just kind of nagging and annoying, could be really easy to fix um, or could need a little bit more investigation but it's something that you don't want to ignore. Um, you know, if one of your kids came to you every single day saying, mommy, I have a tummy ache, right? Or my head is really hurting me. You'd start to say, hey, this isn't right. Let me go to the doctor with them, right? Um, so treat yourself in the same way and say, you know what? I'm not gonna just push this away. I'm gonna either start making a calendar or like a journal or diary of my symptoms and say, you know what? These, this, this is something I can't ignore anymore, right? My body is telling me something. All right. Um, so, you know, a really, really big part of going to the doctor and making sure that you're taking care of yourself is also advocating for yourself, right? What's the point of just making the appointment, sitting in the office, talking to the doctor, and then going home, right? We have to make sure that the reason we came to the appointment is addressed and that you walk away from it feeling like, hey, I understand the issue. I know what my next steps are. I know what the possible treatments or therapies are. And I feel comfortable in that. Like I could repeat it if someone asked me, hey, how was your appointment, right? Or else what's the point of going, right? We're just gonna, that was, it, it didn't help us. All right, so how do, what, how do we advocate for ourselves? What are some things that we can do when we go to appointments? Um, when we talk to a medical professional, mental health professional, anyone who's trying to help us. And I find that it's really, really helpful. One of the, the things that helps the most is making a script for yourself, right? So write it down, right? Sometimes you can get kind of nervous or intimidated and you want to be able to say, hey, I have a piece of paper in front of me or on my phone that I can just read off and remind myself of things that I know I wanted to talk about. So one, make a list of your symptoms. What's been going on? Make a list of questions regarding those symptoms. Ask about the risks and benefits of anything that's suggested so that you have a full understanding of what, what he's talking about, she's talking about, um, and you can help yourself make that informed decision when you know the risks and benefits of um, anything suggested. And then you also want to ask whoever you're talking to, like, what's their experience with this? Like, is this something you see every day a million times a day? Is this something you've seen a couple times a year? If that's the case, if you don't feel like they fully are experienced with what's going on with you, say, like, do you have anyone that I could go see as a second opinion? Like, who else would you recommend? Um, anyone, a big, right, say a red flag for a professional who is hesitant to give um, a name out or a referral for a second opinion. Um, 
maybe that may not be the best fit for you, right? You want to feel like that person's confident in what they are recommending to you. And if you decide to go elsewhere, great. If not, they have, they're confident that you'll come back and, and they can help you. And then again, if you don't fully understand something, always, always, always ask. It's not bad to ask questions. It doesn't make you seem stupid. You want to walk away from the appointment with a full understanding of what is going on with the, um, the condition that you have questions about. Um, repeat what the, the professional said to you. Um, say, you know, I'm just, just, I just want to be clear that I fully understand it so that you have a good enough understanding that you can kind of tell over to someone else that they're asking you, hey, what's going on? All right. Now these same ideas, right, when we're talking to mental health professionals or <clears throat> medical health professionals, excuse me, is also really applies to discussing situations where you may need a halachic opinion or halachic advice. Right. So we don't want when if we have a halakha question, um, you know, is this something where we feel comfortable picking up the phone and calling the rabbi themselves? Do we feel more comfortable having our husbands do it? Um, and I would strongly encourage you to a find a rabbi that you feel comfortable talking to on your own um, and also that feels comfortable talking to you so that when you have your own question about something going on, and a lot of time that ends up being related to OBGYN um, situations, um, at least in my world, <clears throat> um, it allows you to be able to fully explain what is going on with you um, because it's happening to you. So you are the best person to give over what is going on with you. What did your doctor say to you? Instead of kind of like playing like a, a telephone game where you're telling your husband, your husband tells the rabbi, the rabbi tells her husband, right? We can see how this can get a little bit confusing and you want to be able to get the best information you can. And that is by being as clear in your communication as possible. All right, so one very important thing that I think this is important both for a conversation about your health and advice, both with a rabbi and with a doctor, um, but we'll kind of focus on the asking the rabbi part of it now. Um, it's really important to understand the difference between when you're asking a rabbi for a pasak, like a halachic decision on a halachic question versus asking advice, right? Like, do I need to be guided in my decision by what the Torah perspective is, or do I need to hear yes or no, what is allowed, what is not allowed? And I think one of the beauties of Judaism, I think we all know, is that there's so much room for individual circumstances affecting the advice and the halachic answer. And that, um, you know, you should never walk into a conversation with the rabbi assuming that you know 100% what it's going to be because so much of your individual situation gets put into that decision. Um, so it is important to understand the difference between these two perspectives when you're asking questions and being very forthright in saying, that, what am I looking for? Am I looking for a sock? Am I looking for advice um, so that the rabbi kind of understands where you're coming from? <clears throat> and then again, just like when we talked about and when you're at the doctor, very important to ask for clarification. If you don't understand, if you walk away from the conversation and you're not totally sure that he fully understood you or you, the answer doesn't sit right with you because maybe you didn't say everything you needed to say about your specific circumstances, um, go back and discuss it again. It doesn't mean the answer is gonna change. It doesn't mean you're looking for a new answer, but the important part is that you've made, you're advocating for yourself. You're making your situation understood fully and completely. And again, same advice for a doctor's visit as well. All right, so I'm going to segue into talking about education briefly, um, because being, you know, when you go through this whole kind of mind shift of being the kind of person who's going to advocate for yourself, both within your um, medical and healthcare and self care realm and with your rabbis and asking those halacha questions, right? So, what happens when 
we advocate for ourselves is we learn so much, right? Where it's, it's the process of educating ourselves about what may be the best treatment, what may not be a good treatment for me, what may be the right halachic way or the Torah way, right? Like in all of this whole process, we're really educating ourselves. Um, and the education is not just for ourselves. It's important to understand that our children and our husbands both also need that education too. And it may not be with your specific issue that you went to the doctor for or you talked to the rev about, but as a whole and just kind of understanding, well, we want to impart this to our children of advocating for yourself and understanding and listening to your body. Um, so when we focus on educating our children to help them have these skills for themselves later on, there's a few important things that um, will help them, you know, the way we talk to them will help them achieve that later on in their life. Um, age appropriate education, right? We definitely want to make sure that we don't sugarcoat things or hide things or use euphemisms at an age when they are able to maturely understand what's going on with their bodies. So use proper words, don't make things up, they'll figure it out later on or they won't and they'll be like really surprised and shocked and um, almost upset that they were not talked to properly. Um, so that's um, something that's very important. And all of these things can be done in very sensitive ways if you're concerned about um, the proper way or the sneeze way to talk to your children about sensitive topics. And then as far as our husbands go, um, you know, involve them in what's going on with you, right? Like some, especially in OBGYN, um, it's a little bit, sometimes they get a little bit like, it's, it's not my field. I don't want to know about it. Like, just let me know what I need to know to talk to the rabbi or, you know, help you through like a medical situation. Um, but the more that they understand what's going on with you and they care about you, um, the more educated that they are and can really sympathize or help you in a way that you really need. Um, and then just for ourselves again, right? Ask, 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 and read from um, trusted sources, right? One thing that we hear a lot about is, hey, I did my research, right? Make sure you're doing your research from trusted sources, from people who have the experience um, to be able to talk about the subject that they're talking about. So always to be very mindful about where we are getting our information. All right, <clears throat> one more little kind of slide on why educating our children is so important. Um, you know, we can't always just assume that they'll figure it out along the way. Um, it is our responsibility as parents and teachers to help them get the necessary information in an appropriate way. And all of these things here, common knowledge, uh, uh, body awareness, self-respect, self-worth, and confidence really, really do improve with proper education. And feeling like our our kid, they feel like the adults in their lives um, are not hiding anything from them. All right, so again, self care can manifest in many different ways, right? Like spa, facial, mani pedi. Um, other times, it can just be asking for help, right? Finding that person um, and that professional who really can help us find a way, a treatment, a coping mechanism to deal with what we're dealing, um, especially um, and taking care of our health, right? Um, you know, not ignoring um, us and ourselves and our bodies, because when we are healthy, when we are happy, everyone around us also is. All right. <clears throat> so thank you so much for um, letting me go over this little introduction about the importance of taking care of yourself. Um, and if you have any more questions for me personally, there's lots of ways to reach me, email, um, Instagram, Facebook, um, my web, I have a website also, The Confident Kala, um, and um, hope to hear from you. All right, and now I am going to hand it back to Esther Yona, um, and I believe she has um, collected some questions um, that we can go over in more detail. Okay, thank you so much, um, Alyssa, for that wonderful, terrific presentation. And I, I, I wanna add one thing when you talked about self-care and I wanna share a small story. Um, I once had a conversation with a woman who was telling me how she's taking care of this child and she's taking care of that child and she was having some shalom bias issues. And I said to her, who takes care of you? And she just stopped because she realized 
she's so busy taking care of everybody else and their needs that she wasn't taking care of herself. And she was able to reach out for help and to work on taking care of herself and making herself a priority as well. And like you so eloquently said that um, when you take care of yourself, you also have capacity to take care of everyone else um, in your lives. So thank you so much. Um, so let's go to the, oh, oh, sorry, are we still screen sharing? I'm still screen sharing. Do you want me to stop? Yeah, we can stop screen sharing if you don't mind. There we go. Thank you. <coughs> um, and going to ask some questions. Anybody can um, write in or into the chat or into the um, into the Q and A, and if they have any questions. So I'm going to get started with. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna get started with some of that. So you mentioned um, about trusted resources, getting information on trusted resources. If you're online, who would be some trusted resources other than Dr. Google? Right, so Dr. Google, um, you know, that's a funny one, right? Dr. Google is, there's memes, there's jokes out there all the time, like Dr. Google didn't go to medical school, right? Um, the thing, I mean, Google is a search engine, right? You can find a lot of great things on Google. You just have to see what website it is bringing you to. So bigger organizations um, backed up by, you know, government organizations, CDC, WHO, FDA, these are organizations that use studies, they use lots of professionals, scientists, medical doctors, and go through the process, the scientific process of designing studies, implementing them, analyzing the results um, in a very scientific way that um, is not random um, or it's not saying, hey, I saw, you know, I experienced these th this something three times and so now that's truth, right? Um, it's important to look at the degrees and the experience that the people and the websites that you're getting from. So, you know, especially going on Google, looking at websites, you always wanna scroll down to the bottom or click on the little about page and see like, who's behind this? What, are, what kind of experience do they have? Um, are they someone who just likes talking about hormones or do they have a degree in um, prescribing and dealing with hormones, right? As just an example. So um, it's always really important to look behind the scenes, behind the pretty websites and say, well, who is this person giving me the results and do I trust them based on their experience and their expertise? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, here is another question, slightly different venue it says um i don't have a monthly period is that normal so it can be it can't be i think it really depends on the phase of life you're in um and i'm going to assume that this patient or this person is not um postpartum, right? That would be one reason you may not get a period is if you're nursing. Um, not everyone who's nursing does not get a period, but many don't. Um, are they on some form of hormones or birth control that causes them to not get a period? That usually is okay. Um, but if no, if this person is not on anything um, and they just on their, on their natural cycle are not cycling, no, that's not normal. Um, unless they're in menopause, of course, um, then um, that would be a reason definitely to go see a their regular doctor or even their gynecologist um, and get some testing done, um, either a physical exam, some blood work, looking at hormonal levels to see if there's anything, any concern that can be found for why they're not getting cycles. Okay. Um... Sorry, I'm just reading at the same time. Yeah. No um, questions are all over. I had my period and it's been seven days. I can't get a clean badika. Any suggestions of what to do about that? So that's a great question. And that's a question that I deal with a lot um, in my telemedicine practice, because that's a very, right? If you're not 
keeping to and mishpacha, like not such a big deal if you have the longer period, but it is quite frustrating um, in trying to get clean to be able to get to mikvah. Um, so a lot of questions kind of go into answering that. Um, one would be something like, well, is this your, you know, what is your normal cycle length? Um, any, are you on any medications? Are you on any hormonal medications? Um, how old are you? How close to menopause or perimenopause are you? Um, has this ever happened before? Has it happened before and gotten better, right? So there's so many questions behind that um, that can kind of lead us to ways, A, to figure out why that's going on and also treatments for it. Um, when someone is just having longer periods, really kind of easy way to help that is usually with some type of hormonal manipulation. Um, again, discussing like hormones have their side effects, they have their benefits. Um, so that's definitely a conversation to have with your doctor. Um, but um, there are definitely things that are possible to help with that. Is that also something you would speak to the Rav about as well in conjunction or not necessarily, like not necessary when you say hormone um, treatment, mm -hmm. is, is that something to also go and speak to the Rav about or not necessarily? Yeah. So if it's, um, you know, if we're talking about trying like a, a birth control pill, right. And you feel like you want to ask your rabbi about that, um, you know, to either get permission for it or just to kind of get their advice on it. Like, is that something that's okay? Is it something that's going to be long-term or just a short-term trial or treatment? Um, but it's not something you think you're going to be on long-term. Um, so that, I guess that's kind of up to you as far as where, you know, how important you feel you need that guidance um, based on other answers you've gotten in the past, right? Um, and based on how frustrating it is to your, um, your, you know, your marriage, um, are you trying to get pregnant, right? I mean, that, that could be a real halachic concern, right? If you're always have long periods and then you're, um, you know, something with your fertility just isn't matching up well with when you're allowed to be with your husband. So, um, you know, things like that, that, that I think it would be very appropriate to get a rub involved. Sometimes I think it's helpful though, to first kind of get the medical opinion on it so that you can then go to the rub with, well, this is, these are my options that I was given. This is what I'm leaning towards. This is what I'm thinking about. Like, where does this all fit in with what is halakhically permissible or some guidance, um, and perspective on it? Would there be a time when the doctor and the rub would speak together about the patient, like discuss a, a case, a situation? Yeah, I think that I think that would be appropriate in circum, certain circumstances. Um, you know, for anyone aside from a patient to talk to a doctor, we need like express verbal or written consent for to talk to someone else. That's just HIPAA laws and privacy, medical privacy laws. Um, so we would we would need that consent um, up front. Um, so you would like let your doctor know, hey, like, is it okay if you talk to this rabbi? I'm totally fine with it. Um, and then, um, you know, I think what's helpful for the doctor is if, if they're not really getting like, why are they asking me this question? Why is the treatment I'm giving not good or not acceptable? Like, why does the doctor also need the rabbi's like kind of questions and advice and input? And it's because like both of them need to understand the perspective of each other, right? To be able to kind of help the woman as a whole, um, you know, because if, if the rep, if the doctor's just like, here's some hormones, but the rep is like, well, at this point in her life, she doesn't really want them, right? It's just another advocate. It's just another way, another conversation for the people in your life who are trying to help you to, for everyone to be on the same page and not get lots of mixed messages that can be really, really confusing as a patient. Okay, this is really, really good information. So I have another question here. Um, is there anything to do about vaginal scar tissue other than to have another child? Yes, I'd say having another child probably would be the last on my list for treatment of vaginal scar tissue. Um, so I'm assuming what this means is there was a tear um, during vaginal childbirth and the, either the way it was sewn up or the way it healed, it just, it cause, causes pain in that area. Um, 
So yes, there's definitely a few things that can be done. One would be to make sure you have an exam by your doctor, right? Like, does it look like there's something there? Um, a lot of times if it healed too tight or if it healed kind of thicker um, or it hurts where the scar is, um, a lot of times we can actually do a, what's called a revision, meaning like reopen it so and put it together better so that it heals in a different way. Um, so that's um, that's one option. Option number two, which I actually like even better is pelvic physical therapy. Um, it is probably one of the least known, most helpful, um, I guess, treatments and therapies for women, especially after childbirth um, is going to a physical therapist who has a special certification in pelvic floor dysfunction, and they can help in so many things. They can help exactly with this issue and work on massage or work on identifying, um, is it a skin issue? Is it a muscular spasm issue? Um, if sex is painful to kind of help um, come up with ways and exercises to improve that. Um, and really any bladder, urinary issues, um, pelvic physical therapy um, would definitely be a great referral for a situation like this. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, what's your input on a prolapsed bladder? The prolapse letter, again, needs a good exam. Um, definitely something you should not ignore. Um, it is something that is fixable and there's no absolute, I see no, no reason ever to sit and deal with it. Um, especially if you are not 90 years old and um, probably aren't thinking so much about it. Um, it's something that can be helped with pelvic physical therapy. It's something that if um, the prolapse is really severe, um, can be fixed surgically very, very easily, usually with just vaginal surgery. So it's not full like abdominal or pelvic surgery. Um, the thought in, in assessing that goes to, well, what is actually prolapse? Is it the bladder? Is it the uterus? Is it the rectum? And so we do a really good exam. We assess the tone of the um, pelvic floor muscles to make sure that, um, you know, we can't identify any other like kind of fixable area. Um, but um, definitely, definitely do not push that off for yourself. It is a huge quality of life issue. There's no reason you should feel pressure there. There's no reason you should be having like urinary accidents and incontinence. Um, very, very fixable. Okay, that is very good to know. Um, <laughs> at what age should my daughter start going to the gynecologist? That's a great question. The answer is a little bit different, I think depending on who we're talking about. Um, so for a Orthodox Jewish population, I generally recommend as a girl or woman has started dating um, or kind of decided that they are entering into the phase of their life that they could be married very soon, they could be entering into the sexual relationship very soon. And it's a good idea before that starts to identify if there's any problems with the anatomy or other concerns or periods or potential fertility issues that can be identified beforehand. And I think it's very nerve wracking to be like, like, what, why do I have to go? Like everything, I think everything's fine. You know, hopefully everything will be fine after, like I'll go if I have a problem. Um, the problem is, is that problems after can, can just make it be so much worse and so much more anxiety provoking because now you have another person in the relationship you're dealing with the hard hamishpacha issues, um, and it can definitely um, just make the problem a little bit harder to solve or longer to solve if different before, if you had not gone like right before you started all this, when that part of your life wasn't really active yet. Um, you know, if someone is super anxious and nervous about it and they just don't want to, great. Like no one should ever feel forced to go to a gynecologist or um, an OBGYN when they don't want to. Um, it's also sometimes helpful to go and just talk if you feel like an exam is something that um, a woman is really nervous about the first time, like you can ease into it um, or you can kind of hear from the doctor, hey, this is what happens at the exam. This is what I'm gonna do. Like maybe I can do some of it and you just don't feel comfortable with all of the exams. So we'll finish it next year or you know, let me know if there's any problems and then I'll see you back for like a problem visit. Um, but just to kind of understand what that entails is also really helpful. Um, pap smears, I mean, we always 
Generally, pap smear start at age 21. It's cervical cancer screening. Most cervical cancer is caused by HPV, which is a sexually transmitted infection, which most Orthodox Jews are not exposed to, most not all. Um, and so, you know, the age 21 pap smear rule is, I'd say, I'm not like super strict about it, um, but it's, it's definitely a consideration. So I'd say by around that time. Okay, okay, a few more questions um, and then we'll wrap it up, but we have a few more here. Um, can, can scar tissue from a cesarean section cause bowel <laughs> issues like constipation or gaziness? And if so, is there a way to fix it? So scar tissue from a C-section, that is usually all inside the abdomen, right? There's the skin layer, which we can have scar tissue in. Um, and then there's below that, um, where if your uterus, um, when it was closing up, it caused, just kind of grew extra tissue. That's pretty much what scar tissue is. Um, if your bowel stuck to it, if your bladder stuck to it, and there's scar tissue that's developed around those organs as well, um, it potentially could cause some of those things um, or just some pain. Um, gassiness and constipation usually has to do with more like the motility, the movement of your intestines. Um, I don't think scar tissue from a C-section would cause that severe of symptoms. Um, and honestly, the only way to get rid of scar tissue inside the abdomen and pelvis is to go back in there um, and see it and get rid of it. Whether that's with like a next C-section, whether that's with what's called a laparoscopy, just because you're so uncomfortable, they put a little camera inside the belly button under anesthesia and they look in the pelvis and abdomen and see if there's any scar tissue in, and then they can just kind of break that up. Um, you know, sometimes that helps, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I'd probably talk to either your internist, like your regular doctor or a GI doctor. Um, think about a colonoscopy if you are age 45. Um, that's, or have any family history of colon, um, conditions or colon cancer. Um, and that's, that's probably where I'd start rather than jumping straight to C-section. Okay. Um, I, I think we touched upon this before about, um, a single, I guess, a question I would rephrase a little bit differently at what age would you recommend a woman who is not married yet to start going for an annual exam, pap smear, ob OB visit? Yeah. Yeah. And just, yeah, kind of like before, I mean, it's, it's always good to get information before something becomes a problem or, or just be educated so that, you know, if something is wrong, right? Or if something doesn't feel right to you, you're like, hey, I've heard that before from my doctor, if sex is painful, or if I have bleeding after, or if I have irregular bleeding, um, or if I feel like kind of, I'm doing myself breast exams, and I learned about that at my doctor, like if I feel something, um, you know, that's, that's the purpose of preventative care um, and to go to a doctor before there's a problem purely for education and just to make sure everything's right and good from the beginning. Um, so, you know, before when, you know, I think as from an OBGYN perspective, right, I think Orthodox, the Orthodox Jewish women really become, I think, more aware of the GYN area once they are married and in a sexual relationship. And I think so right before that may happen is a good time to say, yep, everything's checked out. Everything's good. I got my education for what's appropriate right now for me um, and, and kind of take it from there. And then have, they have at least established a relationship with someone so that if something is wrong down the road, they know who to go to, right? They just pick up the phone and make that appointment instead of like searching around or asking their friends or mother, like, hey, like I need to see a doctor. Who do I see? Waiting times to get in. Um, so that's also another great reason to kind of make that I'm healthy appointment. Let me just get checked out. So I'm right. So, so just to interject a little bit. So at about what age, let's say the girl isn't ready to date, isn't ready to go out, yeah. isn't looking to be in a marriage relationship. So and let's say she is dating and is 22, 24, 25, 28. At what age would you say a single healthy woman, regardless of marital status, right. should be going to a doctor? Yeah, to I'd say doctor. I'd say between 18 and 21 is a good time to just start getting checked out. Okay. 
Okay, great. Um, here's another question. Um, it's very painful when I have my period, other than Motrin to manage the pain, which doesn't seem to help. Are there other things to do about it? And is that normal? Um, not normal. Um, you know, it's, it's normal to have cramps, right? Periods do are not super comfortable. Um, but pain that is excruciating is definitely not normal with periods, right? Usually Motrin or Tylenol with acetaminophen, which, or the two together actually work nicely. They kind of enhance each other's effect when you take them together, um, can help that, um, heating pads, right? Hot baths, showers, that kind of thing. And your pelvis and back, um, can definitely help relieve pain. Um, oftentimes birth control pills do help, um, make bleeding less, which can then make pain a little bit better. So that may be something you'd want to try um, for bad periods. Um, now, if none of that works, um, or if you before going on like a hormonal birth control to find out to, you know, to treat, you may want to also just get checked out with an ultrasound um, or could discuss your symptoms further with your doctor. Um, there are many conditions in the uterus that can cause really um, painful periods. Is there a fi are there fibroids in there? Is there endometriosis in your uterus? Um, on top of your uterus somewhere within your pelvis causing really uncomfortable cramps during periods. Um, so those are all things to kind of talk about with your doctor. Well, how do I diagnose it? How do I treat it? Um, but you know, if, if pain is, is a warning sign of our body, that's why we feel pain. Right. Um, and so you, you don't want to ignore that. And if it's something that you can't help yourself at home with, that is something that should at least be a discussion with your doctor. If you feel like your doctor is just brushing it off. Oh, that's fine. That's normal. No big deal. You're, you're a woman that's normal. Um, but you don't feel it's normal. Find someone else, go, go to another gynecologist and, and talk with them too. Um, you know, and you'll find someone who can take your symptoms seriously and talk about your options for both diagnosis and treatment. Okay, thank you. Last question, and then we'll call it an evening. Um, uh, here, let me just read it. Someone has a regular period on a monthly basis, then the period starts coming late with a negative um, e early pregnancy test. When should one be concerned? Like, how would you man? How would yeah. you address that? Yeah. So, um, you know, periods do change throughout a woman's life. Um, I'd say probably every decade or so, sometimes after um, pregnancies, um, they can change a little bit. So it's not unusual to to have a cycle length or a cycle um, a cycle uh, period time frame change throughout your life. So that's OK. Um, the I guess the concerning things would be if all of a sudden you have infertility, like secondary infertility, when everything was fine before, and now your peers have changed and you're trying to get pregnant and it's hard, or um, you know you notice that you are fully skipping periods, right? Like you've gone to every month to every two or three months. Um, so that can be a sign that your ovaries are not ovulating as um, efficiently um, or as often. So, or like, how old are you, right? Like, are you getting to the point where you perimenopause or menopause that time frame sounds right, you know, right? You know, and, and periods do lessen over time. Um, in that phase of life, they can also increase. So that, that's a conversation to be had, but there are reasons that are normal that your periods could change like that. Um, but if none of those situations apply to you, um, it is worth it talking to your doctor about it. Um, usually we do start with some blood work, um, looking at different hormonal levels, um, both um, ovarian hormones, brain hormones, thyroid hormones, and kind of look and see is, can we identify a reason that this may happen? Um, but, um, you know, and if not, um, you know, we talk about treatment or doing something based on what your goals are, your goals to try and get pregnant are your goals to just be regular again. Um, even if nothing, if, even if we can't identify if anything is wrong. Um, so it is a very kind of individual situation that really depends on what you're looking for and what we're potentially able to find on a workup. Okay. Uh, is there anything that we didn't cover, Dr. Hellman, that you feel that you want to just address quickly? Um, I know we didn't discuss infertility at all. Um, right. Well, it's a huge like, topic. Yeah, that's such a I big know, topic. I know. But I think I think like one thing that I think is so important that 
is a, applicable to like really any medical topic, um, especially in, in, in gynecology and obstetrics is like figure out for yourself what your priorities are in what your treatments are, you know, we can't always solve every problem. We can't always make everything perfect, but something like a birth control decision. What are my priorities? Are my priorities to not get pregnant? Are, are my priorities to have less bleeding, right? What, what is the important, the most important thing for you so that we can help you with that and hopefully help with other things too, but know like, what are your goals? Like what, what can we do to help you function or, um, you know, for this treatment to work for you as well as it can, because this is what's important to you. Um, and that's something that you, it's almost like you have to figure that out for yourself so that you can then tell whoever you're talking to for advice and for help in that situation. Um, it's especially important with mental health. It's especially important with physical therapy. Um, and a lot, you know, and when you're going to a doctor for a medical problem, right, not just a well visit, um, that um, that's really that kind of self-awareness and self-understanding of what you need to get out of your doctors, right, because it's a two-way relationship, um, you know, is, um, will definitely help direct the care that you get to be what you need. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And I want to thank everybody for joining this evening. This is recorded and it will be available at some point somewhere, probably on the Shalva website or on Dr. Hellman's page. Um, and I look forward to working together again. And again, should anybody need any help or concerns about a relationship they're in or loved ones in, please feel free to reach out to somebody at Shalva. We're here to help you as well. And I wanna just say that nobody should feel that they're alone because we have an amazing community together to help support our families, our people, our women. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Carol, for staying up so late again and everybody for joining. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.